All right, take your Bible with me this morning. I want you to turn to two passages of Scripture. If you'll turn with me to Judges chapter 6, Judges 6. And then once you find your place there, turn over to the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. All right, so Judges 6 is where we're going to begin. Eventually we're going to make our way over to Luke chapter 22. Uh, We're starting a brand new series this morning called Clickbait. Clickbait. Anyone know what clickbait is? Can I see your hand if you know what clickbait is? Okay, here's the thing. You know what it is. You just don't know that you know what it is. A few years ago, uh, I was uh, planning, about three years ago, we were planning our first kayak trip to go away. And so I started looking online constantly for kayaks and looking for kayak paddles and looking for things that I wanted to go and take on my trip. And then, you know, and so this was, I'm I'm the kind of person, I'm going to look and find the best deal. I mean, I'm not going to take forever to do it. But I am going to look and look and look, and when it's all said and done, I'm going to have a really good quality product, and it's going to be a great deal. I mean, I just think it's important you find a great deal, so I'm always big on big deals. And so anyway, so I was looking, looking, shopping around, looking here, looking there, trying to find my stuff. But the funny thing is, every time I'd go back to Facebook, Facebook would be advertising the things that I was looking for. Y'all ever notice what I'm talking about? Clickbait. Clickbait. In other words, here's here's the definition of clickbait. It is a text or a thumbnail link that is designed to entice users to follow that link, to read, view, or listen to the link piece of online content. Clickbait. And uh, we don't even realize this is what's happening. So if you have things that you like, things that you want, uh, for whatever reason, they know how to advertise back to you personally. So if you like cats... There will be articles that pop up and say, how to make your cat live for 30 years. And I don't understand that. I really don't. You know, and so if you're like me, uh, there'll be articles that pop up that say, how to kill cats. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm really teasing about that. Not really, but I'm really teasing about that. So anyway, and so that's what clickbait is. Clickbait is things that they put up in front of you to entice you to click on it to go back to that link to either purchase something or to read something. And so every time you click on something, it's actually providing them a profit. And they know that. So they've got to get the more clicks they get, the more profit that it provides for them. So here's the funny thing. Something that I began to notice about the things that they're putting online and the reason they're putting clicks out there in front of you is because, and, and I want you to catch this, the reason they put it out there, the reason we end up kick clicking on it is usually typically because of a fear. You know, because they'll throw something on there like this. Uh, If you buy it today, an additional 10% off right now. And so, you know, you think, oh, I got to do this right now. I got to do it right now. And then, funny thing is, some of you, you can actually fall for the trick because what ends up happening is you can actually find it for 20% off somewhere else. But you'll click (laughs) because it says if you don't do it right now, you got one hour. And if you don't do it right now, you're not going to get that 10%. And so, again, What happens is that what a lot of clickbait is about is about your fears. The fear that I'm not going to get something. The fear that someone else has something better than what I have. And so here's what will happen. You'll be sitting there looking along. You're you're discouraged. You have a lot of things going on at work. You're a lot of stress. And what do they throw up there? Click here for a free vacation right now. Right? And so I just wanted to kind of get that. So it's something to entice you. But how I want to use that is... Are there things that Satan uses to entice us to fulfill pleasures, and, but, but it ultimately actually increases our pains? We kind of finished a series about this last month, but I want to kind of just roll right into this about what are the things that are out there that Satan's using as clickbait for us? What are the things that are triggering us for fear? I think another thing that's interesting, uh, you know, again, one of, the, one of the big parts, and by the way, if you're in the insurance company I've, or business, I've got a lot of friends who are in the insurance business. But most advertising in insurance is all about fear. <clears throat> you know, if you don't get this right now, you're going to die, and there's no one going to cover your family for this. Or, you know, or your house will burn down, uh, you know, because of, uh, I can't think of what the, the little, you know, the guy who's always on the Allstate commercials, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And so what do they do? It's all about fear. If you don't have this. So the, a lot of our advertisers are all based on fear. But I'm just going to say to you that fear is the, it's funny, fear is the number one tool of the enemy, but fear is also our number one motivator. Here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want you to move from being fearful of what might happen. And by, let me say something about that. It's really interesting to me. Most fear is speculation. 
Anyone know what speculation is? How many of you know that our, that our, uh, our stock market right now is all based on speculation? You know, they're speculating that, you know, something's going to happen, so the oil prices have to go up. Or they speculate that, uh, you know, the, the economy is going to fall apart, so therefore we're going to go into reception. So a recession, these things don't have to happen, but it's a bunch of speculators who are jumping around in the market. And it's all about fear, what's going to happen, what could happen. And here's what I found out in life. Most of the things that we're afraid of never happen anyway. And so, uh, here, let me say, in other words, Satan will use fear in our own lives today of something that's never going to happen anyway, but we're afraid that it might, and we begin to fall into the trap of it. Clickbait. Are y'all y- following this? Uh, a, lot, a lot of the heroes of the Bible, it's just interesting to me, the Bible is, just says it the way that it is. And I love that. It doesn't hide, listen, if I were going to write the Bible, I would hide all the nasty, dirty details of people's lives. You know what I mean? But it doesn't hide it. It tells you they, this person had this problem. Uh, how about this? How about Jonah? Uh, do you think Jonah operated out of fear? I mean, God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. This, by the way, you know how you defeat fear? Real simple, by faith. You always defeat fear with faith. By the way, faith is impossible to please God without faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. In other words, you can't sit there and go, well, if I can see it, then I'll start believing it. No, no, this is, you have to put faith out before you can see the results of it. And so, Jonah, God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah was scared he would lose his life if he goes to Nineveh. If I go and tell these people that they're a bunch of heathens, then I'm going to die. So I'd, I'd rather just get on a boat and sail the other direction. Fear. Well, how can that be overcome? Faith. Uh, how about Noah? Uh, we always think about Noah. Noah built a great big boat put two of every kind of animal on that boat. But I just want you to think about this. Uh, thanks to Noah, Noah's the first incidence of alcoholism that we have in the Bible. Gets drunk. Uh, I mean, by the way, let me tell you, this is how you know that you're really drunk. You know, when you get naked and don't even know it. That's what happened to Noah. I'm just going to say to you, though, there were probably some fears that entered Noah's life that allowed him to go, you know what, I just... I just don't know why I've done all this. I don't know if it's worth it. And fear begins to overcome them. And so they begin to go off into the wrong direction. How about Abraham? You ever thought about Abraham? I mean, just think about this. Abraham, I uh, think about, he was, you know, he, he, he had, you ever thought about plan A, plan B? God has a plan A for you, but do you know it's possible to get to plan B before you get to plan A? And so Abraham, God says, you're going to be the father of a great nation. And Abraham says, well, I need to make that happen. Dude, I'm, I'm 75 years old. This is never going to happen. Uh, you know, and so he comes up with plan B all on his own. By the way, God's plans are always plan A. But he comes up with his own plan, and he ends up uh, sleeping with his handmaiden, with his wife's handmaiden, and she gives permission for it. Where did that wife come from? Right? And it didn't work out so well. And by the way, just think about this. When he's 100 years old, God comes and says, uh, you and Sarah better go and visit Babies R Us. Because now uh, is the time that you're going to have a child. And I just want you to know, 100 years old, that's nasty. <laughs> See, you never think about that, do you? Uh huh. How about Jacob? You ever think about Jacob? The Bible says he was a liar. There was no, there was no one who had more deceit than him. What, what causes deceit? What causes lying? Let me tell you, usually it stems from some level of fear that you're not getting what you think you deserve. Jacob. How about, how about, how about Moses? Think about this. And again, I, just, I want you to see something, that how a person begins to operate in faith. But, you know, here's Moses. God says, I'm going to use you for a mighty call. Think about this. He goes out and he, he draws the children of Israel out. They go into the wilderness. He's by faith trusting God. By, but here's a guy. He's standing at the bush. God says, I want you to go in by faith and talk to Pharaoh. And he goes, I, I can't do it. I, 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 I can't, can't, can't do it. I, 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 I got a stuttering problem, Lord. And I, I, I can't speak. Can you send Aaron with me? I just want you to see the fear. I can't go public speak. You know, you know what number one, you know what the number one fear I, look it up. It's really interesting. Number one fear in our society today is public speaking. Any, how many, how, where are my people who are afraid of public speaking? Can I see your hand? Don't make me call you up here to say something this morning. <laughs> public speaking. You know what the number two fear is? Death. Something is out of order. That means some of you are more afraid of, 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 of giving the eulogy than you are being in the casket. <laughs> this could be a problem, right? 
How, how about, uh, and by the way, think about Moses. Moses goes out, he goes up on Mount Sinai. God says, I want you to write the Ten Commandments down. He gives him Ten Commandments. Uh, and remember, Moses was the guy who murdered one of the Egyptians. Remember that? Now, I don't know about you, but if it were me coming down from that mountain, I might just scratch out one of them. <laughs> Thou shalt not. Because he had already done it. By the way, I just want you to know you can't keep the commandments. Many people think they can be a good person. Let me just say, it's funny, Moses brought down the mountain, the commandments, but he had already broken them. I want to say something to you. Many of us think we can keep it. We've already broken them. But it's all by faith. David, you ever thought about David? You know, here's the mighty king. But one day he had a fear, and he goes and commits adultery. He had a fear he was missing out on something. Clickbait. How about Elijah? One day he has this amazing epiphany, calling down fire from heaven. Turn and read it. Next chapter, he's sitting under a tree saying, oh, God, they're going to come kill me. He just sees God bring down fire and consume all the prophets of Baal. And the next day, oh, God, I'm undone. They're going to come get me. Isn't it interesting how fear will enter into our life? How about Isaiah? Isaiah, three and a half years, he goes around preaching, the, the, for, for lack of a term, the gospel. Goes around preaching about Messiah coming naked and that is also nasty <laughs> and we're not going to do that either how about thomas you ever thought about thomas we often refer to him as doubting thomas doubting Tom yeah, always negative negative thomas always negative about that well oh god you know i don't know about this you know what's funny this is what's really interesting you never not one time go back and read it not one time do you see jesus calling him doubting thomas jesus never calls him that uh how about lazarus you ever thought about Lazarus? Do you think it might have been, do you think there might have been a little fear in Lazarus' life, knowing that he's about to die? Remember, they sent for the Messiah and said, he's about to die, you've got to get up here. And then that day comes. Don't you know there had to be some fear because of the death that's coming on? And you know, what, what, what's the next step? What's going to, what, you know, where am I going to go? And all the people around him were afraid. But then one day, Jesus shows up and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Uh, by the way, it's very important what Jesus did when he said, Lazarus, come forth. You know why? He said, Lazarus, come forth, and didn't just say, come forth. <clears throat> because everybody would have come forth on that day, right? So I just want you to understand, we're all faced with these fears of what the next step is. Some of you have a fear of death. You literally have a fear of death because maybe you're getting up in years and you're starting to think to yourself, what's, what's going to happen to me? I want to address fear today as a clickbait that Satan uses to get us distracted just long enough. In fact, here's what I would say to you. Fear is not intended for you to do the wrong thing. Fear is intended to distract you just long enough so you'll never do what he's wanting you to do the whole, your whole life. Please, please hear me about this. Because I'm just saying, some of you have gotten up in years and you've never accomplished what God's asked you to accomplish. Hey, i got great news for you. you still got breath in your lungs. It's not too late. Start now. Start now. Uh, I love the story of Gideon. I want, we want to read that story this morning. So if you have your Bible, turn over to Judges 6. Look down to verse 1. I want, I want to pick up some things in the story of Gideon, and then I want to talk about Jesus for a little while. But I just want you to know some things about Gideon. So notice some things that were happening in that day. Verse 1 says, Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of, the, of Midian for seven years. Now, let me just help you with what was evil in the sight of the Lord, okay? So uh, they would look over, and they saw the Midianites, and they saw how, they, they saw how, uh, they saw how people were profiting, and they saw how... Uh, have you ever noticed there are people who are ungodly, they don't love the Lord, and yet they're still being blessed? They're still being blessed. And so people began to look at them, get their eyes on people who are being blessed. Okay, I, I look at that today. Uh, I feel like the Midianites of today are like Hollywood. You know, you know what I'm saying? Look how blessed. Oh, they're so blessed. Oh, they're so blessed. Oh, I just wish that we had what we had. If, we, if I was just as blessed as Beyonce. You know, and we, we get this thought in our mind, and then we, so then we begin to pick up, and we begin to do things, and we begin to dress like people who are doing things, and we think that's what's made them successful, so we begin to put that, and so what they would do is they saw these little bales, and they thought, well, you know what, if they're, you know, it's no big deal, it's just a little good luck charm, it's no big deal, I'm, so they would get these little bales, and they would stick them in the walls of their uh, wine presses, or they would stick them in the, uh, on, uh, around, some, maybe just set one on the ground someplace, like a horseshoe. They would set it on the ground next to where they would thresh wheat, and they began to, and they would say, well, we still have God. We still have Yahweh, but, you know, it doesn't hurt. It's not going to hurt to look for this good luck somewhere else. 
that's kind of what was going on. And the Bible says they, they did evil in the sight of, listen, let me, just, let me help you a little bit. They weren't sacrificing babies to this Baals, even though the other people were. Uh, they were they, uh, listen, they were not bowing down to them. They were just, they were just a symbol, just a little symbol. They stuck over there in the corner, and they did evil what was in the, in the sight of the Lord. And then verse 2 says, the power of, of Midian prevailed against Israel because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves, watch this, the dens which were in the mountains and in the caves and the strongholds. And I, I love that statement there. I realize when he says dens, he's really talking about crevices and cutouts in, in the hills. But can I just change the wording just a little bit? Many of us have dens, living rooms. They, so if I say it like this, they made living rooms in the mountains and in the caves and in the strongholds because that was the only place that they could survive. Verse 3 says, for it was when Israel had sown, in other words, they planted their gardens, that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go against them. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel, as well as no sheep or ox or donkeys. So that's the reason why they kept going to their dens and the caves, because every time they'd go out in the fields to try and reap their harvest, so they had to keep hiding because they'd get wiped off the face of the earth. And then verse number four, uh, verse five says, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come in like locusts for numbers. Think about how many that is. In fact, the Bible tells us that Midian, when they were camped against Israel, uh, I want you to catch this, uh, they were still outnumbered. The Bible doesn't tell us how many, but they were still outnumbered. But it, in the beginning of Gideon, when he first finally got warriors to come and fight with him, even though they were outnumbered, there were 22,000 Israelites when it first started. So I don't know how many Midianites, but when the Bible says they were like locusts, there was a lot of Midianites on the land. So he says, uh, 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 he says, but both they and their camels were innumerable, and they came into the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the sons of Israel, watch this, this is key. I want you to catch these words. The sons of Midian cried to the Lord. Now I want to just tell you, that's the answer really to beginning to get the end of fear in your life. Cried to the Lord. And it came about when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on account of Midian that the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, it was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. And I just want you to catch those words because what God says, when you cry out to me, do you know it's me who delivers you from this fear? I'm the one who can take away this fear. Well, let me just kind of move uh, forward a little bit in the story. So I want you to notice how God called Gideon and some of you think God can never use you you think you think that you don't have it in you you're like those who are hiding in the living spaces in the dens in the caves and the crevices because you're afraid of what might happen if you start living for the Lord and I just want you to notice what happens so look down at verse 11 watch this I know very important words because I'm going to come back and hit this later on but watch this the angel of the Lord appeared to him but I'm going to say something Gideon was at a very low place and if you think that Gideon wasn't afraid, watch this. The angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was at Ophrah, uh, which belonged to Joash the Bizarite, uh, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat where? Okay, do you put wheat in a wine press? No, you put wheat on the threshing floor. So what was he doing in the wine press? Okay, you got to catch Because again, uh, grapes get ripe at a different time than wheat gets right and so it's not that there was too much pressure on the threshing floor that he's in the wine press he's in the wine press because he's hiding he's scared in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites verse 12 watch this the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him watch this the Lord is with you O valiant warrior yeah right the guy who's hiding in the wine press and by the way I just want you to catch this is so very important that when God sees you, he sees what you can be and not what you are currently. And so he's, oh, valiant warrior. You're a valiant man of God. But you don't even realize, some of you do not realize that God is already calling you out. And he's saying what you are, even though you don't believe it yet. Just telling you. And so this is so important. We understand the way we overcome fear is we begin to seek the Lord uh, and then as we seek him, he begins to speak to us. As he begins to speak to us, we begin to believe what it is that he says about us. Does that make sense? So again, he says, almighty warrior. Uh, I, I, some of us think, well, you know, this is all fine and dandy, but you know, the Lord's never really understood what we're having to go through. He, he doesn't understand fear. 
like we understand fear because he's God, right? So let, I want you to turn over real quick to Luke chapter 22, and I want you to notice some comparisons between Gideon and Jesus, all right? And by the way, uh, it's way different for Jesus, but on the other hand, there's some real similarities to what we see with Gideon. So I want you to see this, all right? So Luke chapter 22, and I want you to drop down to verse 39, and I want you to watch this. And the Bible says, and he, and when he came out, that's Jesus, and proceeded as was his custom, and that's so important. There was a custom that Jesus had. A custom means something that he did on a regular basis. It, you might even say it like this. Uh, it was a tradition of his. It was something that he did constantly. It was something he was accustomed to doing. Okay, what did he do? As was his custom to the Mount of Olives. And the, and the disciples also followed him. Now just pause real quick and think about this for a second. Where is he going? To the Mount of Olives. What's, in, what's on the Mount of Olives? Olive groves. What's on the Mount of Olives? Olive presses. Okay? He is going to the place where they take fruit and they press it and make something useful out of it. Remember Gideon is in a wine press, different kind of press, but he's in a wine press trying to hide with his wheat because of what he was about to have to face in his life. And he was fearful. But Jesus is in a garden that's an olive garden. But what is he doing there? Okay, what is Gideon doing? Hiding. What is Jesus doing? Again, just notice this amazing comparison. Jesus is going as his custom is, and I want you to catch this, to pray. So I want you to see this because Jesus knows exactly what he's supposed to do. Sometimes we miss it. Uh, in fact, what we end up doing a lot of times, we're praying because we wait till we're so stressed out over the fear that's in our life that we don't have any other place to go. Right? Evidently, Gideon still wasn't that stressed out yet, even though he was in a stressful situation where it hadn't driven him to his knees. But when, in, when the angel of the Lord appeared to him, verse 40 says, And when he had arrived at that place, he said to them, Pray, he says this to his disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Isn't that interesting? Do you know that you all have that? And by the way, I would say, call it this, the temptation of fear. You ever thought about that? You have the, every one of us have. Listen, most temptations take place as a result of fear. What I'm going to lose. Remember, it was Peter who said, I'll never deny you. Why? Because he was fearful he would be without the Lord. Fear has driven him around. Uh, verse 41 says, and he withdrew from them. Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw. That's about, if you were a, you know, if you're a golfer, it's like a little lob wedge, just not too far away. So he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. By the way, this is so important we catch this. Here's what Jesus is saying, if there's another way, if there's just another way. By the way, don't you know if there was another way, he would have done it? I mean, do you think Jesus sat there and said, you know, just for show and just for drama, this, would, this was going to make a great movie one day? I mean, we don't even think about this. And what Jesus is saying is, Lord, if there's just one more way, if there's just another way, if there's an easier way, let's, let's do that. Because what I'm about to have to do is great and it's heavy. Uh, if you had to be the Messiah, would you be fearful if you knew what you had to go through. Okay, I just want you to catch this. If there, Lord, if there's just another way, remove this cup from me. But not what I want, but your will be done. And I want you to catch verse 43. See if you see anything that's similar to Gideon. And the angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. This is so important. I hope you, if you don't get anything out of this message, anything else, listen to me. When you're in your greatest distress, when you're in your greatest fear, God has already sent heaven. By the way, Gideon wasn't even praying for it. And God had already sent heaven down to be among him. I, listen, I, I'm telling you, do you realize around you right now is a, if you could just take five seconds and see the heavenly host of angels that are around us this morning. It would totally change your outcome. I'm telling you, you would sit there and go, what should I be afraid of? For heaven has come. Heaven came for Gideon. Heaven has come for Jesus. Well, I think we miss that part about this. Heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And then verse 44 says, and being in agony. It's a very important word. Because this is what's really interesting. This word agony can actually be 
uh, translated as the word fear. Now, a lot of commentaries, if you go and read them, it's really interesting. They say this was not the same kind of fear that man faced. Well, I want to ask the question, why not? Just want you to think about that for a minute. Because here's what they'll say. Well, it was, it was really more about the commander getting ready to take up his armies. Uh, it's really the commander who realizes the, the weight of command about what he was about to do. But here's what I would say to you. Why, why could, do you know that the Bible says, and we're going to look at this verse later on, but do you know the Bible says that he can sympathize with you in every way? Do you know why he can sympathize with you? Because he faced everything you've ever faced. Amen. In fact, here's what I'd say to you. If you've ever faced fear, and, and every human has, so did Jesus. And, the, and being in agony, being in fear. Watch this. And being in fear, he prayed very fervently. What do you do when you're in the midst of fear? Drop to your knees. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. By the way, we know that this is a real condition. There's a condition, a medical condition called hematodrosis. And what it is, is, and, the, and I actually wrote this down because I thought it was pretty good. It is the condition in which the capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture, causing them to exude blood, occurring under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. This is the, I'm telling you, I've been, I don't know how many, about you, but I'm, I'm willing to bet every person in this room at some point has lived in fear of something. But I have never in my personal life experienced such a stressful time that it caused me to bleed blood. I just want you to know that the fear you have is not as great as the fear that Jesus endured for your sake. And then it says, when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping from sorrow. Okay, I'm going to say this another way. They had fear too. They were sleeping because of the sorrow of what was about. They had fear that was about to come upon them. And verse 42 says, the father, he says, saying, uh, he says, why are you sleeping? He says, get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And I love this because a lot of times when we think about prayer, we think about we got to kneel and pray. You know what Jesus says? Stand and pray. <laughs> what it says, get up and pray. By the way, it's not so much about your position physically as it is about, your, uh, about the presence of God. I hope you catch that because, again, I, I believe that you, I, I wish, by the way, this is what the Apostle Paul says, I wish men everywhere would lift holy hands in prayer. And I, and I wish some of you would get in a prayer mode of just say, okay, God, here I am. I've made it this week. Last week was a tough week, but, God, I surrender my life back to you because I need you this week. I pray and pray. So I want to just give you some things that I notice about Jesus here, okay? Here's number one. Jesus felt fear but did not become fearful. That's the difference between us and him. He felt the fear that you feel, but he never became fearful. By the way, fearfulness will keep you from going God's direction, his path. But he never became fearful. He was still willing to, to be obedient to God no matter what. Lord, if there's another way, show me that way. But if there's no other way, your will be done, not my will be done. He never became fearful. Uh, I, I love this verse. Again, this is a verse I told you we would see again. But Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet, yet, yet without sin. In other words, he never became fearful. This is the difference between you and him, is he can sympathize with everything you've ever gone through. And by the way, this is the great thing about going to him in prayer. He already understands what you feel. He knows the pressure that you're under. He knows the stress that's in your life. He understands all of your anxious ways. But the difference is he never succumbed to it. And what he's wanting to do for you is that if you'll come to him, he'll help to increase your faith so that you too can go through this. But not because you gave, went through it, but because he was strong enough to help you to get through it. Faith. Faith in God. This is what helps us to overcome fear. So Jesus felt fear, but he did not become fearful. Number two, Jesus was fully aware but still called out to the Father. Now, I want you to think about this. He was fully aware about what he was about to undergo. He was fully aware. 
that in just a few hours there would be soldiers who would come up and they would take him into custody. He was aware that they would t- those same soldiers would come and they would pull out his beard by the roots. Those, that he was fully aware that he was about to receive the cat of nine tails and get 39 lashes from the cat of nine tails. By the way, he's fully aware. But you, some of you don't even realize when he was beat, each, this, this whip had nine leather straps that came off of it. And at the end of every leather strap was a piece of bone or glass or rock. You think he just took a spanking. But every time that they would go, that glass and that rock and that bone would embed into the back. It was, it was meant to bring the absolute most pain. And Jesus was fully aware about what he was about to do. And when they would pull back, entire pieces of flesh would come out with that whip. Now I want you to catch this. He had fear. He was fully aware. But he was never fearful. Uh, He was fully aware. But watch this. He still called out to God. My God. My God. Fully aware but still called out to God. Number three, Jesus knew the designer of fear. By the way, the Bible says he was in the beginning. Jesus was in the beginning. He was always there. He's never been not. He's always existed. He he was in the garden that day that Adam and Eve sinned. By the way, before Adam and Eve sinned, he already knew what one day he would have to do. And he was fully aware of the price that had to be paid. I mean, have you ever asked the question, why would God do it? You ever asked that question, why would God do this? If he was really fully aware, and yet he still calls out to the Father, if he was really fully aware, I mean, what in us makes God want us? Because I don't know about you, but I know my fears. I know who I am. And why would he want us? Why would he even desire to pay our price? And he knew the designer of fear. And just think about this. He still went to the cross for you. So someone says, well, pastor, if that's true about Jesus, what do we need to do? How do we get out of this? So let me give you some things. How do I, what do I need to do? What's my part in this? Number one, you need to approach the Father. You need to approach the Father. You need to come to the Father. By the way, if you have fear in your life, and I, I just want you, can I say something? Can I, can I alleviate your fears for a minute? Because it's just interesting how many Christians are fearful of death. <clears throat> Listen to me. I want to say something very clear to you about death, okay? Uh, you will never be in a coffin as a believer. I, I don't know. You need to hear me say this. You are Listen, I, this week we went uh, to a dear family of, here in our church, and uh, a precious family member passed and went on to be with the Lord. We, were in, we went to the home for visitation the other night, and I just had this thought, he's not in there. I, I, we don't even think about that, but listen to me. I, we have this fear that that coffin, we're going to be in that coffin, the lid's going to close, and we're going to go under the ground. No, no. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You will not be, in, you, why do you fear over a speculation? Yeah, we don't understand fully. We don't understand death fully. We don't understand what that's going to look like. But I guarantee you, you don't have to fear something that's not going to happen. You will not be in there. So we need to just go to the Father. Just approach the Father. Number two, not only do we need to approach the Father, we need to admit our fears. Uh, listen, listen to this verse. I love this. Uh, Psalm 34 verse 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from some of my fears. No, he, what did he? All my fears. So we need to admit our fears. We need to admit our fears. We've got to say, God, I, I have some fears that are in my life. Don't, don't, I love, I love these people who are word of faith people. You know what I'm talking about? You know, don't ever admit. If you're sick, don't ever admit it. You know, I'm not sick. <coughs> in Jesus' name, I'm not sick. <laughs> you're just lying to you and the Lord. And here's what I want to say to you. If you've got some fears, admit it. I, by the way, men, I'm speaking to you really specifically about this. Because I can't tell you how often it is that I talk to men. And they have fears, but they won't admit it because they're afraid that it makes them less than a man to admit the fears that are in their life. 
Listen, I'm telling you, God already knows what it is that you're facing. He admits it full of agony, full of fear. Can I just challenge you? You'll never overcome with faith that which has you through fear if you're not willing to admit the fear that's there. Admit your fears. Here's this, number three. You need to abandon them on the altar. So please, please hear me. If I were to say that another way, I would say it like this. You need to lay all of your fears on the altar. If I were to say it another way, I'd say it like this. You need to cast all your fears on the altar. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, cast your burden. We just use the word fear there upon the Lord. And he will sustain you. And he will never allow the righteous to be shaken. We need to take our fears to God and say, Lord, here's the thing that frightens me the most. But Lord, I am trusting you. Abandon them on the altar. Here's number four. You need to allow him to strengthen you. You need to allow him to strengthen you. It says that they will not be shaken. The angels of heaven are gathered around you this morning. Why would I ever be afraid? If God be for me, who can be against me? Why are we afraid? So here's my question to you today. Do you have some fears? Is there some things that Satan keeps putting in front of you saying, click here. If you'll do this, it'll alleviate that fear. It'll take away this problem. It'll take away this struggle. But you know that's really not what the Lord is saying to you. Clickbait. I don't know what your struggles are. I don't know what your fears are. Maybe you're married and you think, I'm in a dead-end marriage and nothing ever good is going to come from it. And you keep wanting to click the button that says, let's just start over somewhere else. Because I don't know if God will ever come through for me. Listen to me. Do not believe the lie of the enemy. Submit it back to the Lord. Say, God, this is a fear that I have, but I'm relying on you. I will not abandon my place in life, but I will abandon the fears that Satan keeps bringing upon me. And I will trust you to be the strength of my life. What are your fears? What's keeping you from becoming the man, woman, boy, or girl that God's called you to be? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to encourage you in just a moment that if you need prayer for any reason that you come here to the front. Maybe you're here today and there's just some hard things that are going on in your life. Would you come and just lay them at the altar? By the way, don't let fear be the fear that this morning that you're going, I know I should go for prayer, but I'm not going to go up there because of what people would think. That's another fear that Satan, it's a clickbait that Satan's keeping you from the very presence of God. So if you know the Holy Spirit's speaking to you this morning about coming for prayer, come, 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 come for prayer. Not one of us is going to look down on you for coming for prayer. In fact, most of us are going to look at you and go, I wish I had that kind of courage. So if you need prayer today, please come. But here's my question to you. What's God saying to you? What fears are in your life that's keeping you from becoming all that God has planned for you? Will you lay him on the altar? Will you trust him for his strength? I want to pray over you today. And when I finish praying, if you need prayer, I want to invite you to come. God, for this new year, for 2019, I pray over my family. I thank you, dear God, for 2018. But God, we're looking for great things in 2019. Father, help us to accomplish amazing things for your glory and for your kingdom. And Father, all of our fears that we have, we lay them before you today, knowing that you have a perfect plan for us. And Father, we wholly trust you. If you're here this morning, you might just want to say before the Lord, Lord, I give you my marriage. God, I give you my family. God, I give you my job situation. I lay them back at your feet, and I wholly trust in you, in Jesus' name.
us very reverently this morning stand to our feet. Let's worship the Lord. If you need prayer, come on. Someone will meet you right here at the front. We would love to pray for you today.